A warm welcome to the January edition of the Uxbridge FM podcast. Coming up this month, we chat to a local psychotherapist. There's a visit to the food bank and double history from Uxbridge FC and Ken Pierce. Let's get straight down to it. Right, welcome along next, Keely Taverner, who is from Key for Change. You're a psychotherapist. You have a little base in Uxbridge where people can come and chat to you. Happy New Year. Indeed, it is 2022. We've made it. Yeah, we can still say Happy New Year, I suppose. At some point we run out of Happy New Year's. <laughs> We're chatting about New Year, New Me. You've got some tips for us. First of all, can we have resolutions, do you think? What's the main tip for 2022? Well, the new year is a natural place for us to start thinking about what behaviours serve us and what behaviours no longer serve us in the new year. We've had Christmas, we've had a break from our routine, so it's natural that you might reflect on where your life is going as you go into a new year. And, you know, as you think about what happened in 2021 and what went well and what didn't go so well. So I think it's natural. The challenge with resolutions is typically we know that they don't always last. Yeah. I think we've got a day coming up in January called Blue Monday. Have you heard of it? This is the the most depressing day of the year or something. Apparently so. When people have given up and their routines, their new routines haven't stuck. I'm a massive fan of habit change. If you can start by changing small habits... Then you get small wins, yeah. which give you a sense of control. It gives you the sense that momentum is happening. And that's one of the ways to start thinking about, is there a particular aspect of your behavior that you want to change? I mean, resolutions might be drinking, smoking, as in giving these things up, not starting them. Um, mm-hmm. A diet, you know, fitness resolution, maybe you want to go vegan. Um, but you're saying start small and then you have more chance of keeping that resolution perhaps. And also thinking about how you might be able to trip yourself up. So Mm. some of that might be you only reward yourself with certain things that you enjoy once you've done, for example, going to the gym. Yeah, little treats. Yeah, you've got to learn how to trip yourself up as well. Habit changes. You know, one of the things I used to do was to come to the office and then go to the gym. So I'd get ready, get washed, put my professional clothes on, at the gym rather than doing it at home. And that was just one of the ways that I incentivized myself. So good idea. Yeah. Finding little ways. Like if you want to drink more water, have water at places where you're likely to come across it. So at your desk, if you're working, you have it there, you might be more, much more likely because you kind of trip yourself up. Mm. That can be much more important. So people that you're seeing at the moment, what sort of the, is it random or what's the main issues that people are coming to you with at the moment? Well, I'll be be frank, you know, I've worked in prison, so there's not much that I've not seen. There's not much (laughs) that I'm not used to. And so, you know, I can see a whole raft of people for a whole manner of other challenges that come along with, be it mental health, well-being, some rather taboo aspects of human behaviour. And have you found that lockdowns made things worse? I think lockdown has exacerbated underlying issues that has made this time particularly difficult, as well as depending on what people do for their careers, you know, how badly you've been affected. But but that's not for every career field, you know, that we know some areas have done OK. Family dynamics, you know, do you still live at home with your parents? Can you afford to? So many issues have already been brought to light. But I think one of the biggest issues I see is uh, people fighting what they can't control. Mm. That can be really difficult for people because you don't get momentum, you don't get small wins, and that promotes the feeling of stuckness. So I'm just really passionate about helping people to see how they get stuck and what they might need to think about doing. Is there a bit of an issue with phones and social media at the moment? Do you think people be doing maybe less on their phones? I think the issue with with phones is I think in in future years we'll really get the full lowdown on the consequence of relationships, isolation, fear, comparisonitis, people never feeling good enough. Mm-hmm. Our attention is constantly being taken away. You know, so many of my friends who used to read don't read anymore. Yeah. What's happened? I guess it must be between Netflix binging <laughs> and Uber eating. And our phones. And I think also not to mention what the apps on our phones are doing. You know, I've got clients who've managed to get themselves in debt with the kind of Klarna 
buy now, pay in three months, which sounds great if you buy on one item, but if you do that mm-hmm. on mass, it's, it's problematic. Uber Eats in terms of weight gains for people and the convenience that's becoming incredibly inconvenient and relentless shopping. So, you know, humans, we find all manner of ways of dealing with with life and its challenges. And, and so certain addictions, you know, getting overly attached, be it to be it drugs, shopping, gaming, whatever people's vices that is coming up. And you can help people just by talking to them rather than using any drugs. Well, I think one of the challenges in the medical industry, if you go to your doctors, there's a high likelihood um, that you might be prescribed medication and hopefully referrals to IAPT programs or CBT. Generally, as a psychotherapist, people come to see me after they've seen, uh, had CBT and they've kind of thinking, actually, I think there's there's something else deeper that I, I really want to understand. And that isn't always comfortable. And I think sometimes, especially if, if you've got a doctor that encourages medication, sometimes that can be challenging for people. Mm. But I'm a massive advocate that I think what I notice is that once people understand the complexity of their situation and they get their head around it, it can be incredibly empowering, self-empowering for them to realise that actually there's a strength to me, there's something in me that I didn't know when I redistribute my attention to what I can control. Because I think um, in the US, perhaps people go and see their therapists a lot, don't they? Perhaps it's a bit more taboo in the UK. Mm. And um, I wonder if it's a it's a name thing. It's got a branding issue. You could say, I'm off to see my coach, and that's perfectly okay. But if you go and see your therapist, There's a bit of a taboo around that still. Yeah, absolutely. Most definitely. And I think in my earlier stages, it's why I often used the term coach because I I was very much aware of the discrimination. And you mentioned psychotherapist and people generally seem to think that there's some sort of issue with madness. Um, And I think we do get a really, a really bad press because people, I think they think we just dwell in the darkness, in the depths and, and difficult things that happened in our lives. The challenge is we need to make sense of that in order to free us from the limiting beliefs that create our current reality. And I think about myself as a testament to that. You know, I was kids, single mum on the checkouts at Ikea. Excuse me, can you leave that yellow bag behind, please? That, <laughs> that, that, that was me, champion for the candles. And reading self-help books, taking responsibility for my life, using education as a transformative tool. So I'm a graduate of Brunel went to Metanoia where I studied psychotherapy at master's level. So I took responsibility for my life and it wasn't that I was going to do everything all at once. It was just small and steady. Yeah. And that's why habit change can be so, so, so helpful to us. And you're currently doing some part-time work at Charing Cross Hospital, um, helping the nurses there who's probably feeling a bit stressed, putting it mildly. Absolutely. It's it's an honour to assist frontline staff as they battle with the challenges that are perpetually being put upon them. And again, just helping people to think about their power, think about what it is that they want for their future as well. So, you know, sometimes that really can be helpful to people who feel that they're stuck and hopelessness sets in. We always have to be mindful of hopelessness Mm. and stuckness and despair. But what are the things that delight our hearts? What are, where are the areas that people have power? And I think if people focus on what they can do and focus on their now, because remember, for many people who are anxious or depressed, we're either worried about the past or fretting about the future, yeah. all of which are out of our control. And living in our now is where you have the greatest power potentially to impact a different future for yourself. So it's always about what we can do in the here and now. And I'm, I'm really proud to see that people are shifting and, and making insights. I'm a big advocate of just going for a walk. There's some nice uh, grassy areas near here. Fastage Park, mm. great hot chocolates mm. from the cafe and a bit of cake. Uh, just take a quarter of an hour out of your day, go for a walk, sit in the park and just chill, mm. you know. Get Deep your steps up. Yeah, that's true. Absolutely. Any plans to go back into the prisons and help with prisoners, or is that not on your cards right now? No, I think I think I've done my time on the front line. To be <laughs> frank, I think I've really done my time on the front line. I've, um, you know, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. Frank Sinatra, yeah. rest in peace. Yeah. But I think that the areas where I really want to move into is helping organisations with their staff. I'm also fascinated in marketing. I'm. Um, checking out the Henley Business School at the moment. Okay. 
Yeah, just thinking about all the different areas in terms of human behaviour that fascinate me. I think I love humans, I love potentiality, and um, I just keep following wherever my interests take me. Mm. So, yeah, new, new horizons. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Keely, for popping in. And um, next time we'll get you to sing some bars, maybe, some little <laughs> little rap. From, I know you. <laughs> in your bars. few years ago, maybe, you were a bit of a rapper. I'm a rehabilitator, none greater. You used to sing it on the wings when the offenders used to stop me and ask what I did, which can be quite intimidating when you're walking around the prison. Yeah. You know, but it helps you grow balls of steel, which helps you in all other areas of your life. So, yeah. Yeah. That's getting out of your comfort zone sometimes. <laughs> that's great. And where can we contact you if we want to get hold of you? You can find me at keyforchange.com or you can find me on Instagram, Key for Change, and Empath Self Protection Channel on YouTube. You can check us out there. Videos for highly sensitive people who feel like often people take their kindness for weakness. Thank you very much. And next, we're off somewhere that's seen a massive rise in people using their service since lockdown, the Hillingdon Food Bank. Carly is the food bank coordinator in their busy warehouse. How are you doing? I'm all right. Nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you too. <laughs> Welcome to the food bank. Thank you. How long have you been here then? This food bank was established in 2009, which was the first food bank in London. Oh. I know, really surprising. There were soup kitchens before, but not food banks. That's so this was the first one in actual London Metro, and they helped to start other food banks as well by providing food to them, by providing mentorship and training opportunities. So it's part of our history we're proud of here. Can you give us a little tour around, do you think? Absolutely. Lots yeah. of crates, we can see. Yes, we Full had a really successful harvest collection where yeah. over 30 schools partnered with us. And they partnered again with us for Christmas, along with the churches and other fundraisers, community groups have been so incredibly generous. So we don't normally have this much, but because we had a really wonderful past few months, we're working through it all. It's a lot of crates. It is a lot. How it's many have we got here, do you reckon? Oh, I couldn't even tell you. Because we also <laughs> will swap crates with grocery stores too. That's why you see a mix of colored ones, the green ones, the blue ones. I think the blue ones are Sainsbury. Yeah. The green ones, I think, are Tesco. There's also black ones and orange ones. Yeah, they're everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> it's a sea of crates. It really is. So when food comes in, it'll come in through these doors. Yep. Uh, we put it, the food on the scale and we weigh it. Yep. And we uh, document who it comes from, how much it was. After it gets weighed, we put, come over here and we sort all the food in here out of the bins. Yep. Anything that's expired, throw out volunteers are allowed to have it we're not allowed to pass out expired food yeah and then it's by the month of the year anything that's going to be expiring in the next three months we try to get out right away other items that we get a lot of and aren't expiring soon will go upstairs in storage and i'll show you upstairs how much we get but certain items we don't get a lot of for example sugar we run out of daily jam pasta sauces, individual noodle packets daily. Those will go straight into our bagging area. Yeah. But a few items that we get a lot of, I'll show you upstairs. Cool. It's a lovely large warehouse, so it really helps. So we have so much pasta that we have to dedicate an entire room to pasta. This is a pasta room? Yeah, the entire room. I must be about, let me just <laughs> estimate how many crates of pasta there are in here. There must be about 100 crates, at least, of pasta. I'm betting there's more. There's more, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> um, and as you see, we mark it by the month and the year that they expire. So it's always rotating up here as well because we want nothing to expire when it's in our hands, in our possession. Over here, this is the tin room. So tin meats, tin beans, and tin soups. We don't often get a lot of um, tin potatoes, tin vegetables, or fruit. So those will never go up here. Okay. Yeah. This is breakfast cereal room. Cereal and porridge. Yeah. It looks like a lot, except that cereal just takes up a lot of space. I suppose. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have biscuits on this side, and we don't normally have a lot of biscuits, but because we had a really successful harvest in Christmas, we have a lot right now. Okay, so if you... Short of a bit of sugar rush for a cup of tea. Yes. <laughs> come up here. Over here is our true overflow room. Yep. Items we don't normally have a lot of. 
like tea and coffee we don't typically get a lot of, but we do right now. Yeah. So we're putting in here. We also have baby food and animal food. Someone donated an entire pallet of ginger ale on the pallet. <laughs> <laughs> so now we have a lot of ginger ale as well <laughs> to pass out. We're hoping that this will last us until Easter because uh, donations tend to go down in January, February, or March, mm. but they'll go back up in Easter. So this room will probably be bare in the next few months, but it will at least survive us the next few months. Yeah. <laughs> I hope the floor holds up. Oh, yes. <laughs> This is our bagging area. You'll see there's signs along the wall. Um, and those are the items that will go into each of the bags. Yep. Families get four bags of food. Couples get three bags. Single people get two bags. And that should last them three to seven days. Once it is packed up, it will come into here, into this room. So if you're partial to, what's this? Um, Watermelon soda. Yes. That's a good place to come. Yes, we have lots of that. I think it's sugar free as well. Oh, great. Family bags are over here. Single bags. Yeah. Couple bags. You'll see there's a row that says special. We do uh, have vegetarian and halal bags that we prep ahead of time in case anyone needs it. Also, if we know someone's diabetic, we will accommodate to a diabetic diet and get that packed together. Oh, wow. So we want to try to be as inclusive as we can. Yeah. Um, that our ability and our resources allow us to be. In a typical sort of family bag, what, what do you get? Cereal, milk, Beans, tin fruit, tin vegetables. Family bags get sugar. We run out of sugar every single day, so we don't have enough sugar to put in the single and couple bags. Mm -hmm. Wish we could, but that is one item that's not very popular to donate. Okay. Uh, toiletries like shampoo, conditioner, body wash. Uh, we also have cleaning supplies and toilet roll paper, uh, condiments, pasta. We also do, thankfully, have gluten-free items on hand, so if we know ahead of time, we can make a gluten-free bag. They get a magazine here as well. Yes, yeah, so this food bank was started by Kingsborough Church, which is just down the road, and they publish a magazine every month, and it has a little article in there about the food bank as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we put them in the bags. And we partner, currently partner with six other churches and community centers to distribute the food. So that really helps us so we don't have to do everything here in this one warehouse. If there's someone in Northwood that needs food, they can go to the church in Northwood. If they live in Rice, if they can go to Rice Lip. They don't have to go so far to get their food. Yeah. And you have vans that take them to these churches, do you, or centers? Uh, they either provide volunteers themselves to come pick up, or we have volunteers that have vans and can help us deliver okay. uh, a few times a week. Yeah. So we cannot function without our volunteers. No. How many volunteers do you have then, roughly? Including the distribution centers, we have around 70 volunteers. Yeah. And they are so incredibly helpful and do wonderful work. It's a big <laughs> operation then, isn't it? 70 people. It is. It is a very big operation. This warehouse, we're open Monday through Friday, 10 to 1 is when we have volunteers. And are you after more volunteers all the time? Oh, yes. Especially drivers. We do need more drivers in the morning times because we do deliver to people's doors oh. who are unable to leave their homes either due to isolating, just having surgery, things of that nature where they cannot leave to come pick up their food. Yeah. So we have some wonderful drivers in the morning. But lately, there has been an increase of demands on people needing food delivered to them. So we are really valuing those few volunteer drivers that are really consistent coming in and helping us. And if somebody wants to volunteer, where do they go? Is there a website where they just come here or what's the procedure? Yes. Uh, so we would just need an email, which is on our website. Uh, it is hillingdon at kingsborough.org.uk. And then we would just need a volunteer application filled out. And then we would do a induction training, a tour of the warehouse, what jobs there are, and figuring out availability. Okay. And can you work random hours or do you have to do certain like, every day or? We have some volunteers that can only do the last Friday of every month. Other volunteers that can come every Monday and Tuesday. Whichever is available, we're happy to take. We do ask if you're in the warehouse 10 to 1 to maximize the time that we have with the people. Otherwise, if it's a driver in the morning, uh, no earlier than 930 and then expect to deliveries to take an hour to two hours. So people have their own vans, companies or whatever that have spare capacity with vans, they can probably get in touch. Yes, absolutely. That would be useful. I guess the people that are 
wanting food? I mean, is it busier since COVID? Oh, yes. I don't know about our statistics exactly, but I know all of the UK. We are a Trestle Trust food bank. Okay. So this is Trestle Trust data. Since 2019, the demand for food has increased over 100%. I think it was over 110% the demand has gone up, Yeah, which is just wild, but it also makes sense. So many more people were having to isolate, losing their jobs or furloughed, and it caused a huge impact on the community. And if you wanted to receive a donation? So we work off of a voucher system, Okay. and to receive a voucher, the Hillingdon Council or the Hillingdon Hub are all wonderful places to get a voucher. The Hillington Hub, you can call and get a voucher over the phone. Council, I'm fairly sure you can also call and do it over the phone or going in. We do it off of a voucher system because we recognize food is not what is causing people to be in crisis, it is a symptom. Yeah. So we want the caseworker to be addressing the actual crisis with the individuals while we are supporting them through the time period. Well, thanks, Carly, for showing us around. It's very interesting. A huge place, isn't it? It is. It is wonderful. And it was, I think it was only about five years ago we were in High Street, and it was a much smaller place with no elevator, but it was on the second floor. Ah. So this is so much better, having a warehouse that can accommodate to all the work and all the needs. <laughs> and vans turning up from parking, I suppose, as well. Yes, yeah. exactly. Well, thank you very much. That's great. Thanks for showing us around. Yeah, thank you for coming. More information on the Hillingdon Food Bank at hillingdon.foodbank.org.uk. Next... The first of two history bits, we're finding out about the history of Uxbridge FC. We're joined by Michael Bodman, who is the historian at the club. Hi, Michael. How are you today? I'm fine, thank you. So first off, Michael, for anyone who doesn't know, where is Uxbridge FC located? It's not actually in Uxbridge, is it? Well, we're currently based at our home in West Drayton on Horton Road. We've been there since 1978. It was previously the uh, Sports and Social Club of Dreyvig, a local company, and we took it over in 78 from them. And I gather that hasn't always been the location of the club. You've moved around a bit. Yeah, up until, we were, well, we were formed in 1871, and until 1948, we led a nomadic assistance. We uh, changed grounds every few years. Our, our main ground, I suppose, was at RAF Upsbridge at the stadium, uh, until we got our own ground in 1948 at Cleveland Road, just by Bruno University. And then, I guess, what happened, you were approached by the university and offered some cash and thought, oh, yeah, we might move, you know. Well, I think there was something like that, yeah. And um, it was difficult to develop that place into a bigger ground than, than we would like. So we uh, had to find a new place that was more in keeping with the modern days at the time, which is, well, late 70s. We actually moved away from there to, say, West Drayton. It's not ideal being in West Drayton rather than Uxbridge, but it wasn't possible to find a ground in Uxbridge that um, suited our needs. What sort of level is Uxbridge FC? What league and uh, where do they play and uh, all that sort of stuff? Yeah, we're in the National Pyramid. Obviously, from the Premier League, you've got down to the uh, League Two, which is the four divisions in the uh, Football League, if you like. Then you've got the National League, which is the old conference, as it used to be called. Then you've got National League North and South. Then you have Premier Divisions of the feeder leagues into that, which are geographically based. And we're in Division One of those. So we're basically about four promotions away from being in the Football League. And it's a semi-professional club, so the players get expenses. Yes, we're semi-professional. The players, you know, obviously have to travel to training two times a week and to games sometimes two times a week and so yeah they get expenses they stop they're not making fortunes they're just basically getting their petrol money (laughs) (laughs) describe the ground for us is it just a little bit of grass or do you've got a clubhouse there or um you have events and things yeah we've got our own clubhouse the uh we've got floodlights obviously for midweek games or this this time of year it gets dark in the afternoons as well by the time we finish the games yeah we've got a clubhouse we have functions there weddings birthdays etc the actual ground consists of the main playing area where the pitch is and then there's another pitch next to that which is a training area 
Um, we obviously got stands and we actually got covered on all, all four sides of the ground. There's covered um, spectator viewing areas. And um, normally you're playing clubs in sort of the the London area, but I gather there's a bit of an anomaly where Guernsey have just joined the league. Yes, we're off to the Channel Islands this year. Guernsey, they've actually already visited us this season and uh, we managed to come out on top by winning 3-2. But we're off to the Channel Islands in, in March if the uh, fixtures pan out as they're supposed to. So that'll be interesting all weekend away for some of us. The players actually only travel on the day and come back on the day. But us spectators, I guess, um, us supporters, we'll be trying to make a bit of a weekend of it. And they're also in the FA Trophy. Um, that's interesting. Yes, we're... Yeah, we're doing very well in the FA Trophy. We've already won four games to get to the third round. The draw hasn't been kind to us in the kind of uh, local way because we're off to Folkestone in the third round to play them. They play in the league above us, so we'll be underdogs, but um, we're looking forward to it. And for a uh, for a supporter, what's the sort of ticket price and, and a season ticket price? What are we talking? For a normal game, it's £10 for ad- an adult, £5 for concessions, and if you're under 16 and you come with an adult, it's absolutely free. Uh, season tickets, obviously, this time of year is probably not worth it because they're £100, which obviously is only 10 games. But that doesn't include your cup games, unfortunately. Cup games are separate because we have to share the uh, admission price with the uh, opposition that we play. And then I guess you're sponsored as well by, by local companies helping you out with the, uh, the costs and things. No, we're not. No. Oh. Unfortunately not. We'd love a sponsor. So potential there for some local Uxbridge company to uh, to sponsor a local football team there. Yes, indeed. So going back into the archives, then, what sort of some of the pivotal moments in the in the club's history? I guess the first pivotal moment would be uh, in 1898. We reached the final of the FA Amateur Cup, which is the um, forebear of the FA Trophy, which we're in this season. The Amateur Cup in them days was the major competition for non-league teams. Yeah, we reached the final, which was held at Crystal Palace, and we played Middlesbrough. And? Um, they, well, they were one of the big teams at the time. When football first started in this country, the powerhouse was really in the north of England. Yeah. And um, Middlesbrough were, were a very good side, and uh, they, they beat us 2 0 on the day. And if you read the reports that uh, in the local papers, most reports say that we were well beaten. <laughs> <laughs> but never mind, the least we got there. And have there been um, players from Uxbridge going up the leagues and playing in in some of the high divisions in history? Yeah, I mean, I can I'll go back to the original times in um, when we were formed in 1871. One of our players at the time, Herbert Heron, was actually a full England international. So we had an England player playing for Uxbridge. In recent times, yeah, we've had a few players who've gone on to play in the football league. Probably the most recent would be a guy called Nicky Kabamba. He used to play for us and went on to play in the Football League. A few others, um, Abu Baker Issa, again, he played for us recently. A guy called Mark Nichols who played for Chelsea. He played in the in European competitions and the Premier League for Chelsea. And uh, his dad was an old Uxbridge player, who's actually the record appearance holder called Roger Nichols. And uh, he was obviously Mark's his son. He ended up playing at Uxbridge at the end of his career. So... You know, we do get some, you know, very good players at Uxbridge. I talk to some people and they say, oh, you're just like a Sunday morning team. No, it's a, it's a lot, lot better than that, believe me. And um, a lot of our players are, are very, very good. It's just, again, some of them are good enough to play at a high, high level, but it's a case of they've got family commitments, they like to play it for a local team. And, you know, it just suits them to play at our level rather than we went to national level. We'd be playing, you know, we'd be travelling all around the country. You probably wouldn't hardly see your family. So it's... um. It is a very, very good standard. Yeah. How long have you been historian of the club? For a few years? I started probably in the early 90s. There was a guy at the club at the time called Peter Grace, who unfortunately is no longer with us. He was doing a lot of research into the history of the club. And you got to remember back in the um, 70s, 80s, there wasn't the internet. If you wanted to find anything out, you had to go to a local library and dig through all the papers and you know, all through the archives there. It's a lot easier now. It's still hard work because um, unfortunately clubs at our level weren't covered that well in papers all the time. And um, yeah, so I've been doing it for about 30 years. And are there club records going back to the 1871 or are there a few gaps? There's a lot of gaps. (laughs) (laughs) Unfortunately, 
there was a fire and a lot of records were destroyed. Peter at the time was going through all the, all the old local newspapers, trying to piece together bits and pieces. I mean, I've I've got every result of every game we've played since 1871. The only things I'm missing is is lineups and goal scorers in certain games. So I'm getting there. <laughs> Not too bad. And is there a, a supporters song or a chant that goes uh, with the <laughs> with the team? Well, we've got to get some supporters first. Our level of support, should I say, is is not very good. It's very frustrating. You know, Uxbridge is quite a big town. Obviously got a lot bigger over the last few years as well, the amount of development going on. But we average at our home games less than 100 people, which is very, very frustrating because the standard of, like I said, the standard of football is very, very good. We're just behind the leaders with games in hand, so we could potentially go second or top of the league in the next few weeks. And like I said, we're in the third round of the FA Trophy. The last 64 teams in the country are in, have got that far, and we're one of them. But for some reason, people don't come and watch us. I wish they would. Anything else that um, stands out in the in the club's history? You mentioned the fire. I mean, is that was that at the ground or was that? Um... No, I don't believe it was at the ground. But I do believe it was at one of the officials' houses or yeah. a store place that stuff was kept. And um, yeah, unfortunately, a lot of the you know, record books and stuff have gone i've got quite a few minute books going back to the 1930s 40s and 50s but they're only minute books they didn't really put everything down that was happening at the club but they you know i've still got them yeah and it's, uh, i mean i've got over three thousand programs from the games that we've played i mean there's quite a lot of stuff around it's just it's not easy you know if you supported like a manchester united or liverpool or chelsea if you go on the internet and just type in one of those for memorabilia, you get, you know, thousands and thousands of hits. If you put in Upsbridge Football Club memorabilia, you get about three things come up. So, you know, it's, it's all relative, but it's, you know, I, I keep trying to find stuff. And um, if anybody out there has got anything they want to let me know about, I'd be happy to, um, to have a look at it. There's a website, isn't there, as well, for the club, UxbridgeFC.com. If you go onto our website, I have done a history of the club. It's three or four pages long so it, it might interest some people to see where we've been over the you know since 1871 up to you know 2021 which if you do your maths we're 150 years old this year so that was um something that we celebrated actually at the start of the season the first game we ever played as a football team was against Southall they were formed a few months after us and uh we played them in a a celebration match at the start of this season and um, unfortunately Southall won 2-1 but we both, we'll cross over that so yeah we're 150 years old there is I say on the, if you go on our website and click on the um, history you can read all about us from then till now but yeah apart from that we we won the Corinthian League in 1960 which is the only championship we've ever won but um, at the time that was a, a big thing um, we were getting crowds in them days of over a thousand watching our games it just shows you that, you know, since the TV came along and you can watch a different game every night of the week and in Premier League, people don't really want to travel to their local club. They rather watch, sit in and watch TV and watch Chelsea and Tottenham and Liverpool and Arsenal and all those. And uh, our crowds have gone from like over a thousand to less than a hundred. So it's frustrating, but we keep going. And I guess on the history side, if anybody in the town has got in their loft or somewhere, any um, memorabilia that they don't need, they can probably send it your way, programmes or information. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in, in the past, I've had people, you know, drop things off at the football club. I've had little scrapbooks where people have, who used to go when they were kids and used to cut out the, you know, the, the match reports from the local paper or they used to keep all the programmes and um, stuff like that. I've had those in the past donated to the club. And like you said, if anyone's got anything in their loft, they, you know, anything associated with the football club, I'd be delighted to see it. You know, if they want to donate it, I've got a big room in my house that's dedicated to Arts and it's full of stuff so that it can go in, in with the rest of it. At some point, we're hopefully going to, you know, make a bit of a, um, not a museum as such, but something in the football club to... So when people visit us, you know, they can look back at the history. And is there a sort of youth team as well with kids that get involved with the club? Yeah, we've, we actually run four teams. We've got the first team, which obviously is, is the main team that we've just been talking about. We have an under-23s team that play in a league called the Suburban League, which again is local clubs. And then we have two youth teams, under-16s and under-18s, again, which play 
in local leagues. One's in Yellow Counties League and one's in the Ishmael Youth League. Yeah, so we have kids, you know, under 16, so 14, 15 year olds. I think our oldest player in the first team is about 35, 36. So there's, there's something for everybody. Any plans for Christmas in the in the clubhouse? Yeah, well, again, the clubhouse is, is open seven days a week in the evenings. It's open, obviously, during during the games as well. And it's open, I think, on Sundays as in lunch times. We don't have anything on Christmas, but New Year's Eve is always a big night at the football club. It's an all-ticket event and it's always sold out and it's a you know a very good night. So, yeah, we have quite a good social side at Uxbridge. It's, um, you know, that's basically what pays, you know, for the uh, the football. Obviously, a nice sponsor would help, but um, at the moment, so we, we pay our own way like that. Well, thank you very much, Michael, for just giving us a bit of information on our local football club, Uxbridge FC. No, you're welcome. No, it's, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, thanks for having me. And continuing our history vibe, we're going to join Ken Pierce next, who is chairman of the Uxbridge Local History Society, to find out about Cecil Sharp. Yes, indeed. The name Cecil Sharp will be familiar to you, I'm sure, because he was the musician and composer. He did so much to rescue old folk songs from being lost forever. He toured the country listening to elderly people singing the songs that they remembered from earlier years. And of course, Cecil Sharp had the ability to note the words and the tunes. His work has influenced many composers ever since. Sharp also took an interest in folk dancing and helped to found the English Folk Song and Dance Society. Their headquarters is significantly at Cecil Sharp House. In the early years of last century, Sharp, his wife Dorothea, and their children were living in London. But Dorothea's health was causing concern, and her doctor suggested that living in the countryside would be of help. So in 1911, they moved to a house in Uxbridge High Street. Well, Uxbridge was much more rural in those days than it is now. They moved into quite a large property called Dragonfield, which stood where the forecourt of the Civic Centre is today. During their stay, Sharp often gave talks and demonstrations of folk dances and songs in our district. For example, one of his daughters attended the secondary school in the Greenway, so he went there on several occasions to teach classes in folk dancing. In 1914, he went up to the local workhouse at Colum Green in Hillingdon and listened to an old man named John Day singing a song that he'd remembered from his youth. So it was duly noted and tells of an occasion when a group of poachers clashed with a team of gamekeepers. And indeed, the last verse suggests that it may go back right to the time when the penalty for poaching and fighting was death. So here's the song. Oh, it's all you young keepers, come listen a while. I'll tell you of a story that will cause you to smile. Concerning some poachers you keepers all know, who fought in these covers some winters ago. It's when we go in, boys, good luck to us all. Our guns, they go off, and the pheasants, they fall. But in less than five minutes, twelve keepers we spy. Oh, begone, you bold poachers, how dare you come nigh? They said to the other, what shall we do now? They said one to the other, we all must be true. For we all must agree to remain as one man 
and fight those twelve keepers till the battle be won. There was one William Taylor would not run away till five of those keepers all on him did play. Young Taylor grew tired and sat down to rest. So Taylor was taken, but he fought the best. The judge and the jury unto him did say, If you will confess, your sweet life shall be saved. Oh no, said young Taylor, that won't do at all. For while you have got me, I'll die for them all. Well, there you are. There's a local folk song, perhaps the only one that survives, recorded by Cecil Sharp at the old workhouse, which, of course, as you realise, in a few years after that, was to become Hillingdon Hospital. In 1915, Dorothea's health had improved, and so the Sharp family left Uxbridge and returned to London. Thanks, Ken. We love a good folk song. Now, a few what's ons to mention. Coming up in February, it's Heart Month at Hillingdon's Libraries. Lots of events throughout the month. Just search Hillingdon Heart Month and you'll find the listings. There's comedy at the Comedy Bunker at the Uxbridge Golf Club. And check out events at the Iver Environment Centre too. More events on the Uxbridge FM event listings page at uxbridgefm.co.uk slash events. That's all for this month. Get in touch by email. It's studio at uxbridgefm.co.uk. Join us on social media. Just search Uxbridge FM. And have fun asking your smart speaker to play the podcast. Just ask to play the Uxbridge FM podcast. Big thanks to Chris Allen for helping out and Luca Nieri for the music. I'll catch you next month.